So I'd like to welcome everybody to the first uh, seminar in the third term of the Political Economy and Law Lecture Series. Um, I have here with me Professor Ellis, who's going to present a paper today on network governance for high sea fisheries, the role of the Marine Steward Council. Uh, professor Ellis is an associate professor at McGill University, Faculty of Law, and holds a joint appointment with the McGill School of Environment. She teaches and conducts research in the fields of international environmental law, public international law, international legal theory, and international relations. Her current research interests include environmental protection and resource management in the global commons, notably the high seas and Antarctica, and issues of regime design and international law, including issues of compliance. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, as Seth has mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the uh, Marine Stewardship Council. Initially, this was going to be simply an example in a, in a, in a paper, uh, but it ended up taking up the whole paper. It's quite a fascinating uh, organization. It's an entirely private organization. It has no form of public authority. Um, and indeed, if you look closely at it, you see that it has very little power or authority of its own. And the only way that it could potentially be a powerful actor is by acting through networks, by trying to leverage the power, the authority, the influence of other actors um, uh, operating in various ways uh, in the issue area of high seas fisheries governance. Now, um, I've been working on high seas fisheries off and on for about 10 years. I keep coming back to it. Um, and it occurred to me as I was preparing for this paper that whenever I come back to it, I come back to it with a different theoretical framework. It's not a deliberate thing, but that just happens to be um, what, what has happened. And I think the reason for that is because high seas fisheries is such an incredibly hard case. So every time you take a, a theoretical framework that you thought was robust and had a lot of explanatory power, and you try to apply it to high seas fisheries, you find all kinds of weaknesses and limitations and flaws. So it seems that that may be what keeps provoking me to, to move on to uh, different theoretical frameworks. And it occurred to me that there might be some interest in talking about um, the reasons why I took up and abandoned different the theoretical frameworks, um, not just for the purposes of being self-indulgent and talking about my own research. I don't intend to be self-indulgent, but rather because I think it may cast some interesting light on what theoretical frameworks do, what kind of work they do, what we expect them to do. And I like to have the opportunity to think about these things because in North America anyway, jurists tend to be very, to be charitable, unselfconscious about methodology. Um, oftentimes when I'm writing grant proposals, my methodology section will look like I'm going to go to the library, I'm going to read some stuff, and then I'm going to write. And I've been trying very hard to think more in more sophisticated ways about methodology. And I think that perhaps um, these struggles with theoretical frameworks um, are helping me to do that, helping me to think more carefully about what kinds of research questions I ask, how I go about trying to answer those research questions, how I identify them, the things that I need to do in order to answer those research questions. So um, high seas fisheries governments, then I have already suggested this is a hard case. Um, it is perhaps one of the most difficult issue areas to govern simply because the high seas are physically very vast and geographically very remote from, from states. Uh, uh, climat uh, climatic conditions are often very difficult. It's very difficult to find out what's going on out there and it is even more difficult to even purport to control what's going on out there. Um, another reason why I'm, I think I'm attracted to this issue area is because we, because there is no sovereign on, on the ocean spaces, we as lawyers can't fall back on uh, our old habits of looking to the state, looking to central authority, uh, assuming that the state will simply adopt and enact laws to cover a, a, a set of activities in a given a physical space. We have already to be much more creative in the ways we think about how to get law out into ocean spaces. Even if we take a very positivistic approach, assuming that law comes from the state, assuming that law functions through um, uh, the imposition of penalties, we still are forced to be uh, more creative than we might otherwise be because there's no sovereign in ocean space. 
Um, with the result, of course, that it is extremely difficult to, uh, to govern those cases. And I'm going to be approaching um, my, my most recent attempt at dealing with high seas governance then has, um, has focused on allocating theory and most, more specifically um, network governance. And I'm going to talk a little bit about autopoietic theory, not purporting to give an overview of that theoretical body, but just to give some insights into how it was that I came to this theory and what uh, insights I think this theoretical framework uh, provides me with. Um, now, just to briefly discuss my previous research, um, the first time I, I wrote on, on uh, high school fisheries, I used um, a constructivist approach. Um, now, constructivism, just very briefly, uh, focuses on the ways in which shared understandings are created. Uh, the assumption is that these are created through repeated interactions, that if the interactions are dense enough and last for long enough, then you may come to the evolution of norms, you may uh, arrive at the evolution of institutions, now, constructivism can be used to explain um, the, the construction of more shared understanding institutions in cases where there are uh, great inequalities of power and influence, um, where force or power are, are in operation. But I think it's safe to say that many uh, scholars, and this is certainly my case, who are drawn to constructivism are interested in uh, consensus building, they are interested in thinking about norms as being effective because they are persuasive, because they are accepted, because there is consensus around them. Um, so this was the approach that I took when I, um, when I began this research. And I thought, and I still think, that it, it did allow me to, to make some progress in explaining changes in the positive law of high sense fisheries. So this gradual move that one can begin to discern from high seas fisheries as a zone of freedom to uh, a zone of obligation, where states um, have accepted a series of obligations, um, in, indeed, uh, by now, a fairly dense network of obligations uh, that purport to govern their activities and the activities of the vessels that are flagged to them on the high seas. But when I try to think about the persuasive authority of law, the ability of law to, to be effective because it persuades, because actors accept its validity, I realized that I was, I was in trouble. This wasn't going to work because the actors that I was ultimately interested in were fishers. And the thing about high seas fisheries is that it's extremely easy for fishers to escape, uh, to operate altogether outside these networks of um, shared understanding to operate outside of the legal institutions that states have gradually begun to erect to, uh, to govern high seas fisheries. Indeed, that's, that's the nature of a commons resource, that uh, especially an open access commons resource, such as fisheries, that it is um, there, because there is no centralized authority, because there is no legal means to compel actors to join um, cooperative initiatives there are perverse incentives operating to, um, to exploit the resource at unsustainable levels. So I couldn't figure out how to get this normative consensus building version of constructivism to have any impact on fishers. Uh, I couldn't figure out how, how to explain law's effectiveness or the potential of the law to be effective using these actors. It became obvious to me that I needed to look at incentive structures. So I turned to um, more economic analyses, rational choice literature, uh, and the very vast and rich literature on common property resources. So obviously a good deal of economic literature or literature with a somewhat economic focus exists uh, to address high seas fisheries. And one of the, um, the insights that came uh, from that literature is this idea that um, but it's a very pragmatic approach, which I like very much. The idea that if we can't, um, if we can't engage fishers and uh, distributors of fisheries products in normative networks, then we can perhaps use incentive structures. Now, we're not going in the foreseeable future to be able to reorganize the legal structure of licensed fisheries such that uh, there is some authority, some, some centralized authority that is capable of excluding actors that refuse to play by the rules. 
but you could potentially, this is the logic behind um, this literature on common property resources, you could potentially change the incentive structure such that it is no longer as interesting as it once was to operate outside of the rules that govern licensed fisheries. How do you do this? Well, um, you think about all the ways in which states and fishers interact, all the ways in which fishers depend on states. And uh, primarily, this is access to markets, access to ports, access to services such as uh, refueling, uh, repairs, provisions, that sort of thing. So, theoretically at least, if you have extensive uh, and, and very deep and prolonged cooperation among a significant number of states, you could potentially change the incentive structures operating on the high seas so that fishers would no longer find it as interesting to operate outside the rules, not because there is any central authority compelling them to come into the, uh, the legal institutions that are erected uh, to govern high seas fisheries, but for, for economic reasons, because it's no longer efficient to operate outside these rules. Now, theoretically, I think this could work, but there are at least two problems. Uh, there are many problems, but two that I want to focus on. One has to do with the, the actual effectiveness of this cooperation on states, and I'll get to that in a moment. But the other has to do with um, what happens to law in this analysis. Now, as a jurist, I wasn't too happy to see that law becomes just another mechanism to create incentive structures. There's no distinction between law and other kinds of uh, economic mechanisms. Uh, law becomes nothing but um, a system for meeting out uh, punishment and, and rewards. And I thought that there must be something more to, to law than that, that law must be playing a more important role than that. And one of the reasons why I thought this must be the case is because, from a fisher's point of view, when you come to a port and you are told, no, you don't have access to the port, no, you can't upload your catch here, no, you can't sell your fish in our market. Now, one response of the fisher might be, by what right? Um, why, uh, what right do you have to deny the access to your ports, to your markets? Now, law does have an answer to this question. It's not a perfect argument, but it's a fairly persuasive one, I think. And that has to do with a reference to um, customary rules that are meant to apply to all states, and therefore um, would apply to all fishes on the ocean, unless they are not flagged to any, to any state. Uh, these customary obligations are very broad, very vague, very general. Um, so all states are meant to be obligated to cooperate with one another in protecting fisheries resources on the high seas. All states have an obligation to implement regulations and to apply them to their vessels as they, as they fish the high seas. Very vague and very general. But arguably sufficient to make the following argument, namely that if a state is allowing its vessels to fish in a zone that's covered by a convention without respecting the rules contained in that fisheries convention, then it is undermining the effectiveness of conservation measures and therefore is a violation of its obligations to manage the resource and its obligation to cooperate. Again, like I said, it's not a knockdown, drag up argument, but it's a plausible argument. And it's not the sort of argument that um, the rational choice structure will allow me to make. So I thought, I can't just, I can't put all my eggs in that basket. I need something other than rational choice to help me make this argument. So I kept constructivism in to try and explain the work that Law was doing. Now I wasn't satisfied with that approach either for a couple of reasons. One is that what I had operating was the logic of Law here and the logic of economics here. And I wasn't able in any way to explain any interaction or any potential interaction between these two languages. I was stuck with two systems side by side. Now the advantage of this approach was that I did gain a lot of insights into the two theoretical frameworks. The disadvantage was that I couldn't get them to talk to one another. I couldn't, and more specifically, I couldn't figure out how the, how the language of law and the language of economics could be made to interact. And the second problem was that constructivism wasn't quite doing the work that I had hoped it would do, namely to tell me something about the specificity of law. Because constructivism treats law as a normative system like any other normative system, but it, it's not as good at telling me what law does that is unusual or different. Why is law different, for example, from ethics? I think it, it is. 
but I couldn't express that difference when I did constructivism. Now, the second difficulty which I mentioned first is the, uh, the effectiveness of this economic approach in practice. Um, the extent of cooperation among states that would be necessary to make this incentive structure sufficiently, um, sufficiently robust to actually change behavior is, is very great, and it escapes, I think, the power of states. Um, I come from Canada, a state that is reportedly, uh, has a reputation anyway, of uh, being very green, very environmentally conscious. It is not. Um, we are very concerned about our fish when other people are catching them, but we're perfectly happy to, to, to fish out populations uh, in our own lives. Um, so you're going to say like Canada that does try fairly hard to cooperate in international fisheries uh, arrangements, often is just not focusing on fisheries, it's focusing on economics, it's focusing on something else. So oftentimes the Canadian government is just not um, it's just not putting its money where its mouth is. And that's true of governments around the world. And then we also have to think about governments, uh, states that are not as interested in protecting the fisheries of as they are in exploiting them. So is there some other way then to get at fishers, to, get to, to figure out how to change the behavior of fishers, to change the incentive structures that are operating on the oceans? Um, now I knew that I wanted my next um, attempt at um, high seas fisheries to incorporate an autopoietic analysis. And when I came across the very stewardship council, I realized that this was, this was a perfect fit. So now in order to um, um, the very stewardship council, it is, as I said, a non-governmental organization, altogether a private actor. And what it, what it does is to set up a certification program. The idea being, um, Certain fisheries are certified as sustainable if they meet certain standards. It's the MSC, the Interstitial Council, that promulgates these standards. Um, now, one of the interesting things about this is that the MSC has to simultaneously create two markets. It has to create a market for certification. It has to make certification a value good in the eyes of fishers, distributors, and retailers. But at the same time, it has to create a market for certified products, more or less simultaneously. So how does it do this? As I've already mentioned, the MSC in and of itself has very little power, very little authority. It relies on its ability to connect with other actors and to leverage any power, authority, influence that they might have. So the MSC, first of all, uh, needs to uh, harness the authority, the, the influence of civil society, I just love this picture of So society, the media, science. So it relies on uh, the authority of science. I don't know what I did just there. It relies on the authority of science to help it communicate with, um, uh, with civil society. Um, science is usually distilled, I think, through the media when it comes to civil society. Very, not so many of us are capable of reading the scientific papers directly. We often get this information through the media. It depends on these kinds of actors, civil society, the media, science, to have some influence on a series of economic actors. So retailers, uh, consumers, fishers, uh, fish processors, And in this way, hopefully create these two markets simultaneously. Now, what it does is very law-like. It promulgates standards that look like laws. Um, and it does so in a way that mimics, uh, to a great extent, the way in which states promulgate laws. It can't do so exactly because it isn't a public authority. But what it does is, first of all, with respect to its governance structure, harness the authority or the legitimacy or the influence of science, civil society, and to some extent, states. So these are some of the actors that are incorporated into its governance structures. So it allows, this allows the MSC to tap into the authority of science, uh, to tap into the legitimacy of uh, civil society, so to um, to tap into democratic principles that make its governance decisions 
um, appear valid in the same way that the governance decisions of governments are valid. But in addition to that, it, focus, it uh, taps into the authority of a whole range of other institutions, some of them state-based, some of them non-state-based. Um, now these are some of the organizations that have uh, standards for standard setting organizations. The Food and Agricultural Organization uh, became a bit concerned with this proliferation of certification programs that purported to tell consumers which fish had been harvested sustainably. And what it did was to create a set of standards for certification bodies. So the MSC took these standards on. It made a series of revisions to its, um, its decision-making procedure in order to try and uh, comply more closely with the FAO's idea of what a good, robust certification program looks like. In addition, the uh, MSC is part of the ICO Alliance. Again, this is a non-governmental organization an umbrella organization of certification bodies. And the ICO Alliance also has standards for certification bodies. The ICO Alliance um, also taps into a series of other organizations, including the WTO, which through its agreement on technical barriers to trade has yet another series of standards for certification bodies. And um, another organization, the International Standards Organization, non-governmental this time, which does the same thing. So we have the FAO, the WTO, and the ISO. All of them have standards that certification bodies uh, are meant to meet. So what ICO has done is to look at these sets of standards and to compare its own standards to, um, to that of these other organizations. Its conclusion is that its standards are as robust as or more robust than the standards in these other, in these other places. Um, Another aspect of uh, the decision-making structure of the, um, of the MSC is a certification. So the MSC is the body that adopts standards. And it does so, again, by tapping into uh, science, by tapping into civil society. But in addition, uh, so when it comes time to actually certify fisheries, it doesn't do the certification itself. This is done at arm's length by certifiers that are trained, who are trained by the MSC, but who are themselves certified by another non-governmental organization, Accreditation Services International, a German, uh, German company. Now, just, this is just a side note, but I think it's interesting to note that ASI also, its standards are also used by states, because in addition to all of these non-governmental certification organizations, States also have um, usually very often voluntary uh, certification programs for green products or sustainable products. And so states will actually refer to the ASI um, to bolster the credibility of their own standards and processes. So already you can see I mean, the point I'm trying to make with this panoply of organizations and different actors and, and uh, different points of entry is that the MSC in and of itself is nothing or very little. But what it's trying to do then is tap into all these other organizations for a number of different reasons. I think one of them is to make itself look as much like a government as is reasonably possible. So democratic legitimacy, the authority of science, um, but also reference to all of these third party actors so that its standards no longer look like the product of the MSC but rather come to look like something independent of the MSC, something that has independent validity. In, not in exactly the same way as law has some kind of independent validity, but I think you can see that the MSC is trying to push its standards as close as it can to formal state-based law. But the other thing it's trying to do, in addition to uh, trying to mimic a state as closely as possible, is, as I said, to try and harness the any power it puts that these other organizations may have. Um, now, a word or two about the, the functioning of this network. Um, it is, I put the MSC in the center of this diagram, but that's just for convenience sake. I think that it's safe to say that there actually is no center to this network. 
um, you can see, you can begin to see, I think, how the success of this program will depend on a lot of simultaneous uh, events, a lot of simultaneous phenomena. And the MSC may have a role in bringing them together in some way. There might be some MSC <coughs> plays in developing convergence. But uh, it is not in control of any of these actors. At the same time, it does behave at times as though it were in control of some of these actors. And one of the interesting things about the uh, MSC's approach is its relationship with states. And I've already mentioned that states uh, form, in a certain way, part of the governance structure of the MSC. Um, state representatives can be incorporated into, uh, can sit on the governance uh, bodies of the MSC. But in addition to that, I've drawn an arrow from the MSC to states here to indicate that the MSC purports to um, govern the governance. And it does so um, by uh, vetting the laws and regulations that states have created for governing their fisheries resources. This is true of domestic um, laws that, that the individual states adopt, but it's also true of the international organizations that uh, the international, regional and international fisheries organizations that states have created. So both with respect to the domestic law of individual states and with respect to the international law within these regional organizations, the MSC vets uh, the quality and robustness of these rules. So it is, if you, if you want to think for a moment in terms of hierarchy, it's purporting to place itself uh, in a position superior to states. But I think that the hierarchical image is misleading because in this way, it's also purporting to leverage the, the political and legal authority of states. The MSC does, does not purport to present its own rules um, independent of those that states have already erected. So no fishery can be certified unless it's subject to um, regulation by a state or an international organization. Furthermore, um, no fishery can be certified unless it's in compliance with those rules. So I think that the MSC is doing two things there. One, on a very pragmatic level, is tapping into a series of rules that have been developed um, in collaboration with scientific and political experts, perhaps economic experts. So rather than reinvent the wheel, it's simply turning to an existing set of norms. But I think in a second move, it's also seeking to tap into the validity of these rules. So the MSC has no formal legal validity of its own. Its standards have no formal legal validity. But I think that there is a move here uh, attempt to incorporate the formal legal validity of state-based law into uh, the network that the MSC is, is trying to construct here. Now, another interesting angle, another interesting aspect of this strange relationship between the MSC, MSC and states is that some of the fisheries organizations that have sought and gained certification by the MSC are actually governmental agencies. So the governmental agencies that are responsible for a given fishery will, uh, from time to time, I, I, I've come up with a handful of maybe 10 cases, um, where the governmental authority actually seeks out the MSC certification. In the same way, as I mentioned earlier, that state-based certification programs will seek out the accreditation of this non-governmental ASI. So there seems to be this uh, interchange happening the states seem to feel the need, at least in some, in some circumstances, um, to have the legitimacy, the validity of their standards bolstered by the MSC, while at the same time the MSC needs the legitimacy and the validity of its standards to be bolstered by states. This is why, one of the reasons why I think that talking in terms of hierarchy is, is probably dangerous, because states here are not being treated as formal legal authorities or political authorities. They are being treated as actors in a network that are useful for certain kinds of purposes. And the MSC is being used by states um, um, in, in very much the same way. So there's this mutual, um, mutual interchange happening there. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, the implications for law. This is the part of the project that is the, 
and is the least well developed, so this is rather preliminary. But one of the things that I um, began to notice about the international environmental law, and it's true to a great extent in domestic environmental law as well, is that it's very hard to, to find the law in the legal regimes. That law seems so often to be trying to behave like some other uh, social system. Now, in order to make this argument, I need to spend a little bit of time on autopoietic theory. Um, in particular, the, the, the main insight of autopoietic theory that I'm, that I'm drawing on here is one of the central insights of that, of that theory, namely the fragmentation of modern societies into a series of autonomous systems. So the systems that I'm working with uh, for this project are law, ethics, economics, politics, uh, science. I think those are the main ones. Now, um, the thing about these systems is that they pursue their own objectives, they develop over time their own languages, their own logics. Um, I recall the argument that I presented a moment ago about the, the legal argument about why it's legal to close one's ports to fishers that are not uh, respecting convention regulations. Now, the law, when it's seeking to influence other social systems, can't do so using its own language. It needs to, uh, it needs to simplify its form of communication with its environment so that it can be understood, so that it can have any kind of influence at all on other social systems. Um, and the way in which automatic theory describes this process of communication across system boundaries is with reference to the code of each system. So law, rather than saying, um, uh, conventional and customary obligations underlying the effectiveness of regional fisheries organization regulations and so forth will simply issue the communication illegal, which will be taken up by other social systems, but interpreted according to their own logic. So what I was trying to do by putting uh, constructivism and rational choice side by side is actually done very elegantly using uh, automated theory. You have law seeking to influence economic actors, uh, and it does so by saying this is illegal, but uh, in addition to it being illegal, it is inefficient. So there's this attempt by law to translate its conclusion into the language of economics. Like any translation, it's going to be highly imperfect, it's going to be uh, a good deal, it's going to be lost in translation. Um, but nevertheless, there will be there will be some form of communication across these system boundaries. And one of the things I think it's important to you emphasize here, and this was something that confused me a good deal about autopoietic theory when I first came to it, is that we're talking here about communications between systems and not communications between individuals. Because early on, my objection was, well, there are lots of people who are bilingual who speak science and law at the same time. That's true, and it's probably also true that if you have a lot of these people working at the interface between science and law, then the, the communication between those two systems will be a little bit better. But because ultimately these systems have to communicate with one another, you're always going to be left with this, this issue of translation. Um, and the, the example that I found to illustrate this point is unfortunately not drawn from um, not drawn from high seas fisheries, but rather from uh, conservation on the land. Um, in the common property resource literature, it is generally well accepted that the worst thing you can do if you want to conserve a habitat, or conserve a species in a given region, is to draw a boundary around it and exclude um, economic activities within, the, within those boundaries. And the reasons why um, this literature, these scholars conclude, uh, that this will be the case has to do with these imperfect translations from one system to another. So you have the scientific conclusion regarding degradation of habitat and endangerment of species, which is translated always very imperfectly into the language of politics. So it's the political objective, habitat conservation, preservation of species. It is translated into a series of laws about a boundary around a space and the kinds of activities that are legal or illegal in that space. The problem is that um, this will then translate into economic terms into inefficiencies. Whereas there may have been uh, incentive structures that were operating in this space that helped the actors to understand the limits um, to their exploitation. Once you draw a boundary around the area and push economic actors out, 
then those incentive structures disappear. And oftentimes the legal incentive structures, this is illegal, if you are caught you will be punished, are nearly as robust as the incentive structures that were operating uh, in the past. This is a highly simplified uh, version of a much more complex argument. And it's certainly not always going to obtain, but um, in many cases, um, conservation authorities have found that um, national parks or, or protected areas in any event actually come to be degraded after the boundaries are drawn. And this is the explanation that, um, that they come up with. And as it turns out, autopoietic theory is a perfect way in order to wish to explain why these perverse incentives are being created. It's because of these imperfect communications across boundaries. Now, can we get to um, less imperfect communications across boundaries? Um, the answer is a very qualified yes. Um, but I think that what we need to avoid is language about integration, about common objectives. In a case like this network, what we see is a certain rather fragile, perhaps rather temporary, convergence on objectives. But as you can see, all of the actors in this network are pursuing, in fact, they are pursuing their own objectives. It's just that by, um, by creating these, they may be temporary, but somewhat stable uh, relationships between actors, um, the objectives can, can line up to some extent. I don't want to exaggerate the extent to which these objectives line up. Because the actors continue to pursue their own objectives, the fishers continue to want to make money, uh, to not have to spend too much money to, to harvest fish, states still want to, um, well, governments still want to be elected, um, retailers still want, to, um, still want to sell lots of products, and so on and so forth. But um, there, there may potentially be a way in which all of these different uh, objectives can, can be pushed in the same general direction. Now, one of the interesting things about uh, this network is the number of different languages or media, as I, call, as I refer to them in the paper, that are operating here. And it's also important to note that there is no convergence of these languages. They remain distinct and remain separate. So you have the MSC, which is, it's hard to, to qualify it, but it's probably acting out of ethical motives, um, desire to preserve and protect fisheries. Um, meant to be the little ethical icon over here. Um, you have science, which is, uh, which is studying um, marine ecosystems and reaching conclusions about um, acceptable levels uh, of harvesting. You have money, uh, the economy, talking about um, efficiencies, inefficiencies. You have politics, attempting, to some extent, I suppose, to translate um, to translate a number of these different desires, a number of these different objectives into the language of political objectives. And you have law, which um, is trying to, trying to find, I think, its own voice. So it's much to do that. Now, the voice of law, I mentioned that it's hard to discern. Um, in international environmental law generally, we often see law um, struggling to, um, well, to interact with all of these other systems. So a lot of international environmental law is very specific standards for um, emissions limits, ambient um, limits for given pollutants. In other words, an attempt to take scientific conclusions and to graph onto them the authority of law. It works very imperfectly, if at all. Um, so you have this very specific, very detailed um, standards and criteria in a lot of these international conventions, often found in decisions and recommendations, not in the convention itself. And then, um, at another point, you have these grand principles, sustainable development, the precautionary principle, common but differentiated obligations, and so forth. And what I think is happening there is that law is trying to translate ethical principles directly into the language of law. Again, with very limited success. Um, I'm not, I, I've been working on environmental principles much all of my career, so I don't want to suggest that these are not helpful or they're not useful or they're not interesting, but rather that to simply attempt to drag uh, a principle out of the ethical system and plunk it down in the legal system is not going to work, which is why you see over and over again people saying, 
Yes, the precautionary principle is very interesting, but it needs to be operationalized. What does that mean? Suppose it means something like it needs to be translated into the language of law in a, in a, more, in a more efficient way, in a more effective way. Um, certainly, we see law um, seeking to transform itself into economics. This is, this is one of my points of departure, where law is treated and comes to treat itself as an incentive structure understands itself as a way of um, influencing the, act, the behavior of actors by making it inefficient for them to do things that are illegal, and so forth. But where is law in and of itself? Um, now, there are lots of bodies of literature that have been cropping up lately that, that go in very different directions, but they all seem to be preoccupied with understanding the role of law in a fragmented uh, system where political authority or even legal authority um, are often being exercised by, not by states, but perhaps by national courts or by non-governmental actors, so highly fragmented political authority. Um, and oftentimes the argument is made in various ways that um, what law needs to do is to understand itself in a more procedural way, that it needs to focus on um, the way in which decisions are taken, the ways in which authority is constituted, um, the ways in which decisions, once they are taken, are embedded elsewhere in the system. So um, this is where I'll be going with this project over the, over the course of the next, uh, the next few months, trying to understand essentially the, um, I think, the tension between this network approach to governance and much more traditional ideas about the rule of law. And in fact, I think I'm going to be relying pretty heavily on Fuller's internal morality of law. Um, my preliminary conclusion is that, at first glance, network governance looks like a, a serious departure from rule of law principles, fragmented, um, often a lack of transparency, um, often very difficult to understand which rules apply in a given circumstance. But my, again, preliminary conclusion is that ultimately network governance with um, a certain emphasis on the procedural aspects of law may actually come much closer to um, the logic behind the rule of law than this, um, than the, the sort of thing that we've been seeing in international environmental law so far, where the law seems to be trying to transform itself into other kinds of social systems. It's groping, I think, for ways uh, to make itself effective. So that's just a, a glance into what I'm going to be struggling with over the next few months. I'm afraid I haven't had much time for questions, but I welcome them if there are any. So I, it's probably the case that when I was talking about um, effectiveness, 
I was intending to refer both to um, the extent to which political objectives are being realized, but also the extent to which law is actually able to have any influence on, on actors' behavior. Let me just have one follow-up question, so I can. So if, if law is always looking for some outside standard of measurement or, or source in which to, you know, like to bring something to bear, um, my question is like, we, you, you bring different regimes. So politics, we talk about legality versus illegality, binary inclusion versus exclusion, we want to bring in, incorporate more things. Mm -hmm. We can imagine a very similar logic in economics, right? Hitting costs, externalities that we want to accommodate. We don't want uh, extra legal markets out there. We want to make them legal because that will allow for capital markets and all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we do the same thing in law, right? So we say we want to give voice to legal actors, we want representation, order. So, okay, so all of them are operating according to binaries of inclusion, exclusion, bringing in hidden costs. Mm -hmm. And there's also a claim that economics seems to be routinizing everything mm -hmm. in some way. So if that's the case, my question is, to what degree does the network theory hold up? So yeah, there's lots of networks and lots of people doing different things, but when wasn't that the case? Mm -hmm. And if all, of, if all these different regimes are acting according to similar logic or similar thing, what's the possibility that there's an overarching underlying structure by which all these different logics are participating in? Or, is, or are you saying it's not the case? And you're seeing them really bumping heads and not able to communicate? At the, at the moment, I'm thinking about them as um, existing side by side without any overarching structure. I see at the moment, because this is a real departure for me. Um, I think that my constructivist analysis tended to always be searching for uh, some way to express common ground, common standards, common points of view, convergence. Um, integration amongst these different languages. And I'm making a, a significant departure now, talking about these different languages as um, not merging into the, I used to, until really very recently, I was using Habermas's approach uh, to ordinary languages being a hinge between all of these different systems. And I'm moving away from that. Um, I think that what you see in this kind of network is, I mean, the way that I described it probably placed a good deal of emphasis on convergence, commonality, um, progress toward a, toward a common goal. But in fact, what I think we see here, um, when we look more closely, is an enormous amount of conflict and tension. Now, all of these certification programs are rooted in conflict, uh, namely the conflict between ethics and economics. They are incredibly controversial among environmental NGOs because for this precise reason, because they're harnessing the language and the logic of economics when it's argued they should be relying on the language of ethics. Uh, it is you know, respect for nature, uh, restraint, um, and environment. Um, and I don't think that this network makes that tension disappear. In fact, I think it, it, it plays on the tension, um, or perhaps it doesn't even play on the tension, perhaps it just has to exist with the tension. So, this is an incredibly fragile structure, and I'm not making any claims here that this is going to solve the problem. I'm simply trying to um, shed a little bit of light on the logic that underlies it. Um, I am actually extremely pessimistic about our capacity to, to prevent uh, the complete completion of, of commercially exploitable housing species. I don't think we're going to make it in time. But I'm beginning to think that if we do, it will probably be something like this. Um, you said that uh, this incentive structure that exists without there being, say, a legal regulation coming from the state would disappear if we would start using the binary code of law. And why is that so? Are they mutually exclusive? Well, they cannot be mutually exclusive because they depend on one another. Um, to say, for, for the legal system to announce to society this is illegal is not enough, that's clear. Um, law has always had to harness some other kind of 
uh, of media in order to have any impact on behavior. So um, the language of democratic principles, this is illegal, translates into this is unethical. Um, the language of perhaps of tradition, this is illegal, translates into this is not the way we do things around here. Um, more and more, uh, the language of law is this is illegal, and if you do it, you will have to pay a hefty fine, or you will, your, uh, your fishing boat will be, uh, will be confiscated. So translating the, the legal conclusion into some other, some other language. Um, and these translations are always going to be imperfect. And I think that the, one of the problems that international environmental law is having, and this is probably true of a lot of other areas of law as well, is that instead of thinking of law as trying to link up with these other social systems, law is trying to sort of transform itself into these other social systems. That's a preliminary diagnosis. <laughs> May I continue with a bit of what I have with John Hester about this question of logic of actions, how they are autonomous, how they are interconnected, whether there is an overarching structure. I think you are quite right in pointing to the central role of networks here, right? because networks are, I think, the main, the main instrument or mechanism to make a connection between autonomous systems. I mean, hierarchy actually is, is, is excluded. Uh, the more interesting debate is about relative autonomy. Mm -hmm. So, like when the Marxist debate about there is a superstructure, then is there relative autonomy of politics of law as against the economy? And so, it's a very similar argument. But the relative autonomy argument always had this problem of uh, yeah, creating a kind of compromise between autonomy and heteronomy. Now, we have 80% to 20% or 50% mm -hmm. to 50%, and it was always meant that. You know, the, the autonomy has to be somewhat uh, yeah, half destroyed or something. Well, if you now come with this idea of the networks, then something very different is happening, namely that the autonomy mechanism is different from the connection mechanism. Uh, so it's not a compromise between one thing being more or less, rather the closure to what autonomy is working in one direction based on one mechanism, on self-reproduction, and then the connectedness is not something taking back the self-reproduction in favor of heteroproduction, rather radicalizing even self-production and then creating a different mechanism of connectedness via networking. So this makes, I think this brings the network to the center, center of the theory when it comes to the question of, of integration. Not integration by hierarchy, not integration by half autonomy or reduced autonomy, rather integration by something totally different in the network against, against systems. And uh, this brings me then also to the, to, to the role of law in this respect. I mean, I think you're quite rightly uh, stressed that uh, in this situation, uh, network having this kind of role, they they are uh, yeah, they are intending to toward the rule of law. And so you, you stress this in your in your opinion. But I, I think I would go even further. I would say uh, it's not just tension, rather it's a transformation of the quality of law in the sense that law now instead of creating a kind of unified coherent whole is has a role of promoting contradictions, mm -hmm. of promoting uncertainties, of promoting paradoxes. And this has very much to do with this role of, uh, yeah, of, of uh, yeah, bringing different contradictory logic of actions together, not destroying them, but making contact possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea of law, law's mastery over society has to be abandoned. And after the rule of law, the one thing that has to go, I think, is the idea of law as a coherent unified system with a, with a, a clue norm and um, all of the other norms drawing their validity from the same source. I think that we have to, we have to do away with that. Um, the logic of, when you, when you read the literature from geography or from uh, common property resources literature, the emphasis is on, they, they don't speak of law, they speak of governance. And the, the, the common refrain is uh, resiliency. We need social systems that are resilient. What does that mean? They have to be capable of learning, adapting. Um, they have to be capable of innovating very rapidly, working under conditions of uncertainty. Um, and so all of this means that 
high degree of flexibility, it also means that the law itself comes to be um, exactly a zone of uncertainty. And it also means, I think, um, that as Carl has said, don't suggest that law comes to play a facilitative role and not a, a role of mastery and governance. It's not on top, it's, it's uh, essentially a kind of, I'm not sure if I'm happy with this term, a kind of broker amongst, uh, amongst these different systems. So I would ask, you know, somehow I feel like the individual is completely absent from this picture, which in some ways is really odd because the, the, the issue is about the fishers, mm -hmm. right? They are really going to change the current situation, the depletion of high sea fisheries, it's really going to depend on changing the behavior of the fishers themselves. Okay, and so I think there's, it would be interesting to, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you see the relationship between the individual and these set, these different logics in the transnational network. Because the, I think the Ostrom and the CPR uh, literature, what is really interesting about this is that they bring the, um, so they describe the individual as basically having uh, two really meaningful choices, right, when it comes to law, which is basically you either support the current status quo mm -hmm. or you find an alternative. And in order to make that decision, you have to have information, right, mm -hmm. about the costs, right, the best the costs and the benefits of doing one or the other, right? And it seems to me that in order to have that, I mean, in order for this to be meaningful at all, it, you have to have, in, you have, there has to be the ability to make an impact on a political level. I mean, changing something um, through politics. I mean, it seems like that's implicit in that, that somehow in order for, uh, that's the only way to really change the law, or I mean, in those from frame. Mm -hmm. um, and yet in, this, in, the, in the trans uh, national network, in the network that you've described, I mean, one of the features is that it seems extremely undemocratic in the sense that all of these institutions are not transparent, not accountable. They, it seems like a one-way one road in the sense that you know, the, um, the MSC has an influence over these uh, over states. But the states don't necessarily seem to have uh, uh, impact the other way around, and also the individual in connection to the state has seems to have no impact. So this this relationship seems to be really disempowering for the individual fishers. Yeah, uh, I don't I don't know how. I mean, I think it's a really interesting framework to use theoretically to understand networks. I think it gives you a lot of insight into how these networks work. But in terms of really solving the problem of the fishers themselves actually changing the incentive structure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. I'm really glad that you mentioned the individual because for, for many months this was um, an incre a huge stumbling block um, for my comprehension of autopoietic theory because the thing that I cared about had to do with um, what happens when people hear arguments. Um, what happens um, what about that process of judgment, that process of reasoning? And there was absolutely none of that in autopoietic theory. It all looked, well, I mean, it's drawn from, um, from, from biology, from computer science. It's, it all looks like, well, systems and very personal and very asocial. Um, and I, I rejected the approach over and over again for those reasons, but I kept coming back to it because Every time I, I read, and not every time, but very often I would read an interesting remark in a paper, and I go to the footnote. I want to talk. Just remark. Okay. I get it. Um, but I read um, a paper by uh, King and Schutz, in which they talk about Yuma, um, uh, the two months of the, um, uh, of the the major pioneers in autopoietic sociologists in autopoietic um, theory. And one of the points made by them was that Humann's approach is actually more humanizing than other sociological approaches because it doesn't seek to essentialize individuals. It doesn't seek to describe individuals as being essentially members of a family or essentially members of an economy or essentially members of a polity. It doesn't leave individuals out of the equation altogether, but rather it focuses on the systems in which they're going to be participating. And um, that really struck me, um, first of all, because it, um, it helped me to understand uh, the difference between communications between individuals, which is something, if I'm not mistaken, that autopoietic theory just doesn't have a lot to say about. 
may very well be mistaken, but I take that as a limitation of the theory and not a flaw. All theories have limitations. There are certain things that they focus on and other things that they exclude. But the other thing is that, um, the other aspect of that is that uh, the human being, the individual, comes to actually play a much more, um, a much more rounded role, not being limited to any one kind of, any one kind of logic. Individuals participate in hundreds of different kinds of logics, and using hundreds of different media, probably every day. Um, and this is one of the reasons why it's possible for these systems to communicate, after all. Um, this is an insight uh, from Hunter Tonner's writing, that um, there will be convergence on unique phenomena. A contract is an economic transaction. It's a promise or an ethical transaction. It's uh, a legal transaction. It's all of these things. But in addition to that, it is a transaction in which some people uh, uh, enter. So the individual does come in, um, is absolutely crucial in a way to theory, but there is no attempt to describe exactly what the individual is. And I think that that's actually a, that's a strength of the theory rather than a weakness. As for the, um, the lack of transparency, um, the lack of attention to democratic principles, this is, I think, a problem with um, society rather than with autopoietic theory. One of the other things that, that kept leading me back to autopoietic theory is the claim by autopoietic scholars that they are very much concerned with democratic principles, with human rights, uh, with human flourishing. Um, and the, the idea, I guess, is that um, this rule of law approach where you have the hierarchy um, doesn't, is doing a worse job at promoting democratic principles of human rights and human flourishing than these, um, these different networks would do. And there is a leap of faith, I think, that's involved in that. Uh, so it's difficult to, um, as a leap of faith always is, it's difficult to make that leap. Um, but um, one of the arguments that you made Professor Chandler in, I think it was called Bukovina, was what would happen if people didn't always turn to the state every time they wanted a problem solved? What would happen if instead of turning to the state to regulate the corporation, you turned to the corporation and demanded that it, it regulate itself? It poses a question, but it's an extremely provocative question. There may be a good deal of entropy right now because everybody is always, well not always, but often making the demand of the state, which has, after all, extremely limited uh, means at its disposal. And that's emphatically clear when we're talking about the high seas, but it's true of a lot of other areas. So the individual is definitely there. Um, the concerns with dem democracy and transparency are definitely there. They're treated, I think, in a completely different way. Um, and um, in, in a completely, well, for somebody who came from Habermas and constructivism, in a completely unfamiliar way, it was, uh, felt like the ground was uh, being taken under my feet, actually. Okay, so I, I, I would say I agree with the kind of over emphasis on the state at the, at the center. So possibly you don't, let's take the state out of the equation, but in, in, in um, asking a kind of further question about this particular structure of the MSC, how much are fishers actually involved in the certification process? Do they sit at the table? I mean, so using this model, if you don't necessarily need to go through the state, you can go directly through the corporation yeah. or through the certification process. Is that happening? That's what I guess would be the... I think in very indirect ways. So in the governance structure of the MSC, there is a place at the table for just this sort of catch-all category of actors, sort of other, and they include um, industry actors, so that could be fishers, but it could also be retailers, um, processors, uh, government representatives, representatives from civil society organizations. They are all in, in this one governance body, more or less all together. Um, so the voice of any individual um, category of actors is bound to be muted and indeed might be drowned out by others. Now fishers are always going to be of concern, but I think that they were, um, are extremely uh, ill-treated in the current positive state-based structure. Because the, the states that have created these, these incentive structures, these elaborate rules and mechanisms, these regional fisheries organizations, are the ones that uh, were wealthy you know, 20 or 30 years ago and could afford 
uh, whose fishers could afford to fish the, uh, the high seas. It's an expensive project. You can't go out with a small skiff. You need a fairly, uh, a fairly substantial vessel, all kinds of technology, fairly state-of-the-art equipment. Um, the, the system, I'm talking here about the positive state-based system, is, I think, completely and utterly skewed against uh, developing countries, against small-scale fisheries, uh, against any labor virus of fisheries. Now, the NSC is, at the moment, not doing much better at all. As a matter of fact, a common, a, a continual criticism of the NSC is that it's failing, um, that there are very few developing countries and fisheries that are certified. Um, its standards are, are not appropriate to the context of a lot of those fisheries. Developing country uh, industry actors have a good deal of trouble um, here at having their voices heard at the table. Um, but I think it, it may be the case, and I want to make a strong point here, that this structure is uh, more amenable to participation from developing countries and from smaller scale fishers than it is the FAO, uh, UN, um, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, these very vast, very complex bureaucracies where um, local knowledge, um, for example, has to be translated into um, the language of uh, Western science or else it won't be heard at all. So there is a possibility that this system, that this network structure is actually a little bit more open. There's no, I mean, at the moment, that's not the case. At the moment, um, the NSC is doing just as poor a job as the state of structure. But I see a little bit more possibility coming from there. Great. Hey, thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.